I'm Ariane Elephant, and this is Death the Podcast. Death can be defined as the destruction or permanent end of something. At Death the Podcast, we are looking closely at what happens when something ends. We listen, learn about, and discuss the stories that surround the subject of death. These stories bring up much more than feelings of fear and sadness. They offer opportunities for connection, for hope, and sometimes even for humor. Ultimately, if we are open to exploring death, we create greater potential to experience life. My guest today is Rose Vines, a self-described writer and geek. Rose is originally from Australia, but has spent the last 19 years living in New Orleans. Rose is an award-winning computer journalist and a longtime social activist. One way Rose utilizes her technology skill set is in her present role as the communications director for Sister Helen Prejean at the Ministry Against the Death Penalty. Rose joins us on Death the Podcast to shed light on what the Ministry Against the Death Penalty does. Welcome, Rose. Thanks very much, Arion. Many of us know of Sister Helen through her book and later the movie Dead Man Walking. The images of Death Row portrayed in that movie stay with you, I think. And I'm wondering if you could walk us through and describe Death Row. Death Row. (laughs) It's... um, it's hard to describe death row without describing Angola prison um, because that's the main death row that I have visited. I've visited others in Texas, but um, the one I usually visit is Angola, Louisiana State Penitentiary, and Angola is its own place. Um, it, it gets its name from the slaves who are on the slave plantation there who are mostly from Angola the country and it's in this beautiful part of Louisiana you drive up through St. Francisville and um, turn off the scenic highway onto an even more scenic little back road called Tunica Trace and you drive down Tunica Trace and it's just beautiful it's hilly and green and lush and lovely and it empties itself into the prison the road just stops at the prison. And the prison is 18,000 acres. It's huge. And and it's not just one prison. When Once you go inside um, the barbed wire fences, there are multiple prison camps in there. There's general prison and there's um, a prison for those who are on discipline and there are prisons for trustees who've had good behaviour over the years. And you get processed through security and put onto buses with other people visiting. And most of them are going to the general prisons. Um, And death row used to be right up near the front gate, but now it's the very farthest corner of Angola and you you drive on the bus and everybody else gets off at the other prisons and usually I'm the only one on the bus, maybe one, one other person there. And going through fields of okra and beans, and it's a working farm where you 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 go there and you see men in they're not in chains, but it's almost a chain gang with um, officers on horses with guns pointing at them, and they go out in terrible hot weather and work these fields. And so you you go through the farm. Um, there are cattle. There's even a a waterfowl preserve and you eventually the bus gets to death row and there's this little sign, death row, surrounded by flowers, all very sweet and welcoming. (laughs) And you go through gates and, um, and into death row and it's a, it's a low concrete block with a number of arms and, um, the staff are lovely on death row. And I think mostly they choose staff who are experienced enough that they know to keep things calm because there's enough going on that could explode in death row. Mm-hmm. So the staff are welcoming and you get to know them and you joke with them while the person you're visiting is being brought to the visiting area. And I visit a, a fellow called Manuel Ortiz, who's been there for over 22 years. And the usual visitation is a non-contact visit. So he's brought 
into one side of a cubicle and you're on the other side with a, um, a glass partition and there are phones that hopefully work that you use to talk and there there are two phones for cubicle per cubicle and prisoners are allowed up to five visitors at any one time but there are only the two phones so if you have more than two of you there you have to swap around and and you talk through the glass and and visits are usually around about 3 hours and the the really interesting thing you know people it's very surreal that's the word that I think most people come up with when they talk about visiting death row because the the conversations you have can be beautiful and wonderful while you're there because for example for Manuel my visit will be one of the highlights of his month he's fortunate he gets a number of visitors sister helen is his spiritual counselor she visits him um he's got some dedicated friends who've been visiting him for a long while um most of the men on death row have no visitors ever um but manuel we we get to visit but it's this high point in his month and i've got to know him over the years and he's a lovely lovely man um and you talk for three hours. Yeah, and, and, and we have food. We can order food that's made by the prisoners and and so I can buy him a meal and I have a meal. And it's pretty good. It's good Louisiana cooking, <laughs> you know. It's it's uh, fried catfish or, you know, whatever, good food. And, and so we share that through the glass. He's very uh, religious. He's um, Catholic and he's, uh, so he'll always say a grace when we're having the meal. And then we'll talk. And over the years, sometimes those talks have been very, very hard because he had difficult times with his legal representation and was almost ready to give up. Um, but but more often than not, they've been wonderful talks and he um, he's passionate about movies and he can tell you a movie from start to finish with every nuance the accents and he gets very very animated and and uh and some and, and so the are these movies that he he watched before no he um on death row uh on their tier they have televisions and they have a television that can be seen across through the bars oh. shared by two um, two cells. Then recently, the the prison took away the Turner Classic Movie Channel, <laughs> which was a horrible blow to him. And um, but then he talked to one of the the visiting. Um, I'm not sure who it was, but it was a, a someone who managed to talk about how important that was, and they got it back. And and I realise as I say something like that that there are probably people listening to this who think, well. He's on death row. <laughs> Why should we care <laughs> that he gets his Turner Classic movies to watch? Um, so, I, that, and that seems like a great thing for you to talk about. Yeah. Well, I mean, why should we care? Well, because um, how we treat people on death row is about us much more than it is about them. Um, if we choose to kill people, that's about us, and that's on us. Um, if we choose to ignore the conditions that we let people live in, that's on us. Um, if we choose to be vindictive and try to inflict as much pain on them as we believe they've inflicted on someone else, that's about us. Uh, it's about um, what level do we want to live our lives? How do we want to live our lives? Um, and I and I say it in that way because I I mean it about prisoners who are whether they're guilty or innocent. I'm firmly convinced that Manuel is innocent, um, and there are many reasons why I believe that. Um, his lawyers believe that, um, but his there are many people on death row who are not innocent. Um, and there are people on death row who have done terrible, terrible things. 
and those people on death row are still human beings and they they are human beings who often change completely from the human being who committed the crime that they did. Um, and one of the things about not having a death penalty is to allow people the chance to change and maybe the chance to make good some of what they've done that was bad. But I think we also really need to acknowledge that 156 people have been exonerated from death rows in America. That's 156 people who got a complete pardon. There are actually more who've been released from death row because of prosecutorial misconduct and other things. But these are 156 who were released because of... They were, they were innocent. <laughs> and most of them have spent 10, 15, 20 years on death row um, before they are released. And most of them get no compensation for their loss of their lives there. And a recent study said that probably f at least 4% of people on death row are innocent. Um, so we, we're sending innocent people as well as guilty people to death row, so we should, we should care about it. Um, but we should also care about it because... Uh, well, Sister Helen says something which I think is really uh, speaks to me, which is um, each of us is worth more than our own worst act. And I think if you think through your life <laughs> and think of the worst thing you've done and then imagine being frozen in that space and put on public show and everybody saying, this is who you are about. This is you. There's nothing else that matters about you. This is it. And that's not a truth about any of us. None of us is our own worst act. We're all so, so much more and so much better than that. And and I, that's what I've found. You know, visiting death row, I, I mostly visit Manuel, but I get to talk to some of the other people there. And these are human beings. And... One of the things we know about human beings is that we're evolving. We evolve over our lives, um, if given the chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what drew you to start working for the ministry in the first place? Did you come in with, with this mindset you have now? It's, it's funny. Um, I think back to my uh, – when I was in Australia and, and my first political act was when I was about 11 or 12 – and um, the Victorian government, Victoria's state in Australia, was going to hang Ronald Ryan. And no one had been executed for quite some time in Australia. This was in the 60s. And I was horrified. I, I thought it was barbaric. And so I wrote a letter to the premier of the state protesting it. And, when you were 11? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and they hanged him. They hanged him. But it, it had been so long since the last execution and there was a lot of controversy over it and it was the last execution in Australia. There was such an outcry about it. And, um, you know, I I grew up, I, I was quite a political animal. I, uh, I was involved with um, Vietnam demonstrations uh, when I was young and and and, uh, and when I came to the US um, I wanted to do some volunteer work and I found myself in New Orleans I thought here I am in the the south where poverty and racism and religion all of uh, intersect in the death penalty and I knew it was the home of Sister Helen Prejean. So I sought out her organisation and offered offered my services. And it's not that this is my cause. <laughs> um, it's that 
I can't imagine living life without wanting to improve the universe. You know, that mm-hmm. sounds very grandiose. But, you know, for me, the 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 meaning of life is to try to make the world a better place when you leave it than when you entered, no matter how small your contribution is. And so I always look for ways to do that, and it just seems that the death penalty in the South in particular was a really um, key uh, thing that needed changing. And I think the it, it is a keystone in a way. Like there are some big issues around prisons in the US, including just mass incarceration, w- warehousing of people, and uh, life life without parole, putting people away without any chance of change or redemption. And if you have the death penalty as your ultimate punishment, it makes everything else seem lighter and less. And w- warehousing people, well, who cares? You know, it it doesn't seem anything near as bad as the death penalty. In Australia, we don't have the death penalty. We don't have life without parole. And if someone gets the maximum sentence, which is something like, you know, 25 years, people say justice has been served. In the US, because you have the death penalty, if someone gets 25 years, it's why didn't he get the death penalty? You know, why isn't my family more Im- as important as the others where they, the murderer, got the death penalty? It's this thing that you open up your whole consciousness to what I regard as a more barbaric, barbaric way of thinking by having the death penalty there. It allows your mind to go there. Mm-hmm. If you take it out of the mix, as we've done in Australia, it's like... You you raise your consciousness because you you don't even go there. You you don't think, oh, we have to kill our own citizens to be safe. You think of other ways <laughs> to make yourself safe. And Australia is a much safer country than the US. There are lots of reasons for that, but we do not need the death penalty to make us safe. So I see it as... Um, one of the ultimate human rights issues in the US. And I think if we change it, there are a lot of other things that will change eventually if we abolish it. And where do you feel like the state of things is with abolishing? Ah, I think it's hopeful. Um, I think a lot of things are coming together that are will lead to the end of the death penalty. And some of it is the number of exonerations, the fact that people now know that we've put innocent people on death row. Mm-hmm. And whereas I think we tend to, we, we do, we hide prisons away and prison conditions and everything, and people are very comfortable not having to think about what we're doing in prisons. You know, they're like Angola, they're remote, no one goes there. Um we, but I think the exonerations have allowed people's minds to go there to think, what is it like if you're on death row for a crime you didn't commit? If you've got the threat of being executed for 15 years over your head for a crime you didn't commit? And I think that's the sort of thing where people's, people can understand the terribleness of that. So I think that's one thing that's got the public changing its mind. Um I think that the botched lethal injections that we've had in the past year and a half in particular in places like Oklahoma, where it took an hour, an hour and a half to kill prisoners, where the wrong drugs were used, where the process was excruciatingly painful, where you had a governor at a basketball game unreachable while she was supposed to be on the phone ready to stop an execution at the last minute. Those things, I think, um, have caused public outrage. More and more conservative voices are being raised against the death penalty because they say 
it's how can you trust the government <laughs> to kill your citizens for you when they can't maintain your bridges for you. Um, there are all sorts of things that are coming together and there are more and more people who are um, raising their voices, including ex-wardens, victims' families, who say killing the murderer just re-victimises them. The whole process is so excruciating and it makes victims of the murderer's family as well. So a whole pile of things are coming together. And I think if you'd asked me this 10 years ago, I would have said it's going to be two to three decades. Um, if you'd asked me three years ago, I would have said 10 years. And asking me today, I think I'd say three years. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you are seeing a lot happen. Yes, we are seeing a lot happen. What I've found is most people know almost zero <laughs> about the death penalty. They have they have an opinion based on feelings, mm -hmm. but they don't have any idea of what they're actually they actually have an opinion about. They don't realize that only poor people are on death row. That vastly more people go to death row for killing a white person than for killing a, a person of color. Um you know, they don't realize so many things about about the death penalty. Um, and that's what we do um, with Sister Helen and the Ministry Against the Death Penalty. We really tell stories about the people on death row. And in doing so, people, people can relate. You know, you can give people any statistic um, and it's not going to change their mind. But if you give them a story that they can relate to and then talk to them about the facts, they can hear the facts. And that's what we do. We, we, so we, who do you all talk to? Well, Sister Helen is amazing. She's, um, she turned 76 this month and she does around 100 talks a year. And, I mean, her schedule is enough to put your head in a spin. <laughs> And uh, so she talks across the country and, and internationally to all sorts of groups, schools, colleges, um, uh, professional organisations, church groups, uh, anti-death penalty groups, all sorts of, all sorts of people. Um, and we, um, my, part of my job as a geek <laughs> is... Um, I, I run all her websites and social media and we get her voice out to a lot of people that way. And she's recognised as the world's leading anti-death penalty campaigner. So, that, so she already has a following and we use that and Facebook and Twitter and other media to reach out further to more and more people and... Um, and uh, and there are her books, which, you know, we get into the school. There's Dead Man Walking, which is the one that was turned into a movie and then a play and then an opera. Mm -hmm. So it's been all mm -hmm. sorts of <laughs> art forms. And um, The Death of Innocence, which was her second book. And she's going to take a, a break from talking for a bit to finish her third book, um, River of Fire, that she's working on at the moment. But... Um, so the books and the movie and the opera, which was recently in New Orleans, performed in New Orleans, um, uh, and the play, which has been done by several hundred schools, performed by schools, all those ways gets the word out. And um, and and each of them, you know, it's where we're not. I, some people would think we're a a political activist organization, but I think more what we are is a storytelling organization. I wanted to go back to um, the the person that you visit with. Yes. Uh, is it Manuel? Manuel. Manuel. Um, and ask about w what your understanding is of how he sits with knowing he's on death row for a crime he didn't commit. It's it's 
extraordinarily hard and he works very hard to protect me and his other visitors from how hard it is. Every now and then he'll let a he'll he'll give me a little insight. Um he I was thinking about this when I was thinking about talking to you on a a podcast about death and I think a lot of what people deal with if they're facing death and no death is coming to them or someone in their family or whatever is acceptance how to accept it on death row you fight it all the way it's not about acceptance and especially if you're innocent you you do not want to go there and you do not want to accept that you will end up there because it's not right and so you you don't you don't talk about accepting it um mostly manuel and i do not talk about what could happen and we don't even talk about what could happen uh, if he got off if he 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 doesn't want to he doesn't want to be freed he wants another trial where he gets a fair trial because mm-hmm. he says that's all i need um but we rarely even talk about that because he said i cannot afford to hope and i can't afford to lose all hope it's a it's a very strange situation to be in occasionally we talk about he he'd like to go take sister helen scuba diving if he ever gets <laughs> out <laughs> and um i want to tag along too so the, you know so he occasionally will talk about the what ifs but mostly not um you know he's very isolated from his family uh, it's it's a very remote place to visit his his own son was pretty young when he went to prison and has had to work through having a dad who's on death row and it doesn't matter if your dad's innocent he's still a a death row prisoner you know the the mail that i get from manuel is stamped death row mm. you know it's um it's a label that's there and Manuel's had a grandson while he's been in prison who he's seen a few times um but n- not very often um so he's pretty cut off from his family he is around my age so getting close to 60 and recognizing that even if he does get off he's um two two or more decades of his most active time in his life is gone uh, and and the conditions in angola death row are horrible um you know there was a a a court case brought against the prison for essentially baking the prisoners um it it's been so hot in there the air conditioning didn't work that you know they had no air conditioning and manuel t- told me that it would get so hot that it was as if he had two large men lying on top of him all the time when he was trying to sleep it, he said his heart would race with the heat and uh, he'd get down on the concrete floor and and just try and survive each night and then the day would come and it's even hotter you know it's a it's a hot house so it's horrible conditions that you're he's experiencing for a crime he didn't commit and i think for many years the way he he survived it was to focus on the minutia of his case and try and work with his lawyer and try and find a way to get out and uh and I think that's pretty true of a lot of prisoners that they know their case and they know a lot about the law around their case in in and out um 
and uh, he, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how he survives it with such grace, really. And and a lot of people on death row. The 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 U.S. prison prison system is the largest mental institution system in the U.S. And a lot of people on death row have um, mental illness. And if they didn't have mental illness when they went in, they have it now. And so there's, um, uh, you know, a lot of people who it unhinges. Um, It hasn't unhinged Manuel. And... uh, but it, sometimes it's very much day to day. Yeah, and and I really, really don't know how hard it is for him because he does protect me. He's, you know, he's told me I don't want to tell you about what it's like. Hmm. Um, so he'd, he'd prefer to talk about movies and he would and politics. He loves talking about <laughs> politics and uh, and reading. And, and, and probably just so much appreciate your company, like you're saying, looking so forward. Yeah. Yeah. And to go without that kind of contact and then have three hours of, I mean, that in and of itself, I would imagine that an intimacy develops between the two of you that most people don't sit and talk to somebody else for three hours. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, uh, it's very intense. And, uh, and, and never quite know what it's going to be like. And occasionally we get contact visits, which are just amazing. Um, and in a contact visit, you there's a contact room. So it might be just you and the prisoner you're visiting, or it might be some other people visiting other prisoners. Um, but it means you can sit down together and have a meal together and without the glass between you. And, and it, I had a contact visit with him a few months ago, and it was the first time in so long and I was eating something and he'd ordered something else. And he looked at my plate <laughs> and and he said, that looks good. <laughs> and I, it was, I was having the catfish and I picked up a piece of the catfish and handed it to him. And it's such a simple thing. I mean, you, you would do that with someone at a, you know, a friend at a table any time. But it was such an enormous thing for us to be able to do. And the fact that that's such an enormous thing is heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. That, that to hand a piece of food to someone made us, gave us so much pleasure. Like we, we both ended up holding that piece of catfish and looking at each other. Um, and so those contact vis- visits are especially precious. What's, what's it like when the three hours is up? It well, leaving is okay. Um, you know, if 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 we don't have a contact visit and we're on either side of the glass, we'll just hold our hands up to the glass and touch our hands through the glass and uh, and say farewells. If it's a contact visit, we get to hug, which is just such an amazing, wonderful thing, and then. He's he's always in shackles. Uh, he, he, his hands will be free um, during the visit, but not his legs. But so they'll reshackle him. But usually, by the time they're doing that, I'm leaving. For me, um, I said earlier that it was surreal visiting, and and it's that contrast of having these beautiful, beautiful, intimate visits, and all the time. At the subconscious level, you know you're in a death house, a place where people have been placed before they will be killed. And when I, um, I used to, I, I'd um, drive home from Angola, and I found myself having little micro sleeps. You know, where you just uh, go to sleep for for a quarter of a second or whatever and I thought this is dangerous and it's because I'd be having these visits which felt good on the top 
but underneath absolutely sapped me, completely sapped me, and I still do. When I go to visit death row, I I always make sure I have a cup of cold coffee sitting <laughs> in my car for when I get out so I can just stay awake because I'm so drained. And it's knowing where I am and knowing that I can leave. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I was thinking as you were... You described so beautifully the experience of driving in there and the contrast of how, how I mean, w- what your surroundings are like and then what you're going into. Yeah. Um, and was thinking about the experience of then leaving mm-hmm. all that you're holding, which, I, I mean, to me, it makes sense that you must feel a level of exhaustion mm-hmm. from the intensity of that, whether that's spoken or not, yeah. and probably harder in some ways that it that it's not spoken. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So how do you how do you go home after that? Um, well, it, it used to be <laughs> that I'd have to drive all the way back to New Orleans through the traffic of Baton Rouge, and 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 I'd arrive home and I'd I'd be truly exhausted, and. I think I'd be so exhausted that I wouldn't even think about it for a while. Um, after Katrina, we built a what we call a hurricane cabin <laughs> just north of St. Francisville. And so now I, I drive there. I go and stay there in this very, very peaceful place. And I think what I do is really just hold Manuel with me. And my friends all know that I've gone to see him. So if they're up there, they'll, they all want to know how he's doing. He always inquires after the people in my life. And, uh, and they all want to know. And I think it's just my way of connecting him into the world by sharing what I've been through with others. Um, yeah. It's... It's it's very hard to let the reality of death row, even when you visit it, into your life, because it's such a it's it's a very strange idea. This one of put, taking a healthy person and deliberately killing them. It's it's a very very bizarre thing to do. So to to live in its presence even in the small way that I do, it it can be hard to let it gel with the real world. I I can only imagine the the contrast of being so close to all of that, um, and then going back to your world. I'm really impressed by how much you've clearly internalized him. Like he clearly is a part of your your outside world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so appreciate what you what you said about the mission of the ministry. That a lot a lot of really w- what y'all do is share stories. Mm-hmm. I feel like you did that for us today. Uh-huh. So thank you so much. Thank you. The word death evokes all sorts of personal feelings, images, and stories. These stories are compelling, and sharing them connects us more fully to life. I'm Ariane Elfont, and you've been listening to Death the Podcast. Join us for our next episode in this series. This show is produced and engineered by Eric Merle. Our associate producer is Jill Gross. Our theme music, It Happened, is written by David Milling and is performed by David Milling and Charles Milling. To hear more of David's music, go to his website, davidmilling.com. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher or some other podcast app, if you can take a moment to rate and review us, that helps other people find us. You can find Death the Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, or at deaththepodcast.com. Death the Podcast is a production of INO Broadcasting. If you want to find out more about Helen Prejean's work, you can go to sisterhelen.org. If you'd like to learn more about Manuel, go to manuelortizisinnocent.org.
You know Labor Day signals the unofficial end of summer, but not the end of your outdoor projects. Lowe's helps you do it right and helps you save with Labor Day deals throughout the store. Shop now and get two bags of Stay Green Potty Mix for $12. And keep your lawn looking neat and trim with a Craftsman 2-Cycle 17-inch gas string trimmer, now $20 off at just $119. Whatever's still on your to-do list this Labor Day, do it right for less. Start with Lowe's. Offers valid through 828. Soil offer excludes Alaska and Hawaii, U.S. only.